Ladies and gentlemen, we're particularly privileged, if I may say so, to have here with us today to chair our second panel on professional conduct issues which are contemporary, the Honorable Charles Dubbin, Chief Justice of Ontario. Chief Justice Dubbin was called to the bar in 1944, having won the gold medal at Osgoode Hall. He was the youngest person ever appointed one of, I'm tempted to say, Her Majesty's Council, but it was in fact one of His Majesty's Council in 1950. He had a very distinguished career as one of the leaders of the bar. He was appointed to the Court of Appeal bench in 1973, and he was appointed to the, to the position of Chief, Chief Justice of Ontario after having served as Associate Chief Justice in March of 1990. You will know that he has served as a chairman of an inquiry panel into aviation safety in Canada. Um, he has also served as a commissioner inquiring into the practices and procedures of the Hospital for Sick Ch Children in Toronto, and of course he served on the, as a Royal Commissioner on the inquiry into the use of drugs in sports, most recently. Chief Justice Dubbin, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Gavin. Well, I'm very uh, pleased to be here this morning and joining you. Um, it's much more comfortable indoors, I'm sure, than outdoors today, so you're all <laughs> ought to be congratulated for your determination to improve your proficiency and advocacy in the bar and your regard for the ethical conduct of lawyers. Uh, I first want to introduce my very distinguished panel. I'm just proud to be associated with them this morning. And on my right is uh, Dr. June Colwood. Uh, June, of course, is known to everybody in this province, this country. An author, a lecturer, and I read in Rosemary Sex this morning, an entertainer as well. <laughs> <laughs> she has served as a lay bencher of the Law Society uh, for some three years, I think it is, and uh, she's made a permanent contribution to the work of the Law Society, which is one of her many causes that she's championed uh, throughout her distinguished career to date. And we are sure going to hear a lot more of June Colwyn. On my far left is uh, Robert Carter, a QC, one of the leading members of the criminal bar of this province. Bob and I go back a long time. I first met him when he was associated with Arthur Martin, the dean of our law, our criminal law bar, and um, carried on Arthur's practice with the same high ethical standards of conduct that his mentor had taught him. Uh, my immediate left is Earl Cherniak, one of our leading members of the bar of this province, one of our best customers in the Court of Appeal, um, and a very versatile counsel uh, at home in every courtroom, in every type of case, and uh, also has devoted himself a great deal to the betterment of our profession. And I'm always indebted to him for taking the time out, as he does so often, to advance the cause of the legal profession. On um, our right is uh, Mark Somerville, uh, a little younger member of the bar. <laughs> anyway, he looks young to me. <laughs> <clears throat> He's a specialist in civil litigation. He practiced here with the firm of Gowling, Strathy, and Henderson, and now is practicing in the more serene part of the province in Kitchener. I think that's why you look much younger, uh, Mark, uh, and more rested. And um, he's chairman of the um, of the professional conduct committee of the Law Society. We're going to hear from him very quickly. And of course, Stephen Travis is senior counsel of the Law Society, and one of his uh, specialties is the field of ethics. He's of great assistance to the members of the bar. He's a friend of everybody and available to help all those that are in need of help. And indeed, that's one of the purposes of the meeting today, is to inform you of the facilities of the Law Society itself, uh, to assist you um, in the many contentious matters you're dealing with today. But may, uh, perhaps just by way of overview, and um, following the earlier discussion today, I think sometimes we overlook the fact that uh, the members of the profession are a very privileged few. You're privileged because you have a state-granted monopoly, the only ones who can practice law. 
also privileged because you're governing your self-governing body, a self-governing body. And with um, privilege comes responsibility. And I think the highest duty you have to yourselves as a profession, and as a corollary of the privilege that you have, is to conduct yourself at all times with the highest standards of integrity and ethics inside the courtroom and outside as well. And also, we hear a lot about the Charter, and we often overlook the preamble, which says that this country is founded on two principles, one of which the principle of the rule of supremacy of law, the rule of supremacy of law. And so, in a country founded on the rule of supremacy of law, as members of the bar, you have an added responsibility. That is, at all times, be defenders of the integrity of law and champions of the rule of law. And so I hear so much about free speech and the Charter Guarantee of Freedom of Speech, but it's been well recognized in the United States, and I hope someday in Canada as well, that members of the bar who are pleading cases or acting for clients have a special responsibility duty. They are not the client, and they're not the client's mouthpiece. They don't have this freedom of speech that the client has, or the public have, or the media have. So in some respects, as long as one wants to be a member of the bar, you have to impose yourself a duty. That is, to speak only within the confines of your duty to the court, to the profession, and to the rule of supremacy of law. Otherwise, take your gun off, give up your profession, and you'll be feel to speak much more freely than otherwise you would have today. And I'm very proud of this bar. We're very lucky in this province. And I'm so delighted to see so many of you here to <coughs> learn more and be, learn how to be cautious of what the rules are and what the rules are not. I want to speak, have Mark Somerville speak to you for a few minutes on his role as chairman of the Professional Conduct Committee, what that committee does, how it's available to you, and how it can serve you best. Mark? Thank you, Chief Justice. I, I want to say, first of all, I had mixed feelings about your introduction. On the one hand, uh, I hope that uh, none of you present will tell my Ottawa and Toronto partners in Gowlings <laughs> that the uh, practice in Kitchener is serene and <laughs> less stressful because that's the kind of information that influences the units committee once a year. <laughs> On the other hand, I was very pleased uh, uh, to be described as young when you've just had your 52nd birthday. You're, you really pick up on those kind of uh, leads from the bench and, and I, you're, you're, those are the kind of things you agree with readily. The history of the rules, uh, I, I won't bore you with, but uh, the present uh, incarnation of those rules uh, were adopted by the Law Society in, in 1987. I emphasize that we are talking about the rules of professional conduct, uh, unlike the uh, title in the program indicates, uh, and not the code of professional conduct. The code of professional conduct is, of course, the code that uh, uh, was adopted and promulgated by the uh, Canadian Bar Association. Uh, the rules of professional conduct, which you all have handy on the right corner of your desk, of course, uh, were adopted uh, in 1987. And uh, they are, uh, you may find it of interest to note, uh, as uh, Chief Justice Callahan stated in the Klein case uh, in uh, 1985, the, the uh, pre-existing, are part of the law of Ontario and subject to the constitutional uh, restraint of the Charter. Uh, it may also be interesting to note in passing that uh, uh, Justice Callahan, as he then was, said uh, uh, that the attempt uh, of the Law Society in that case to differentiate between the uh, rules and the commentaries to the rules was not something which he agreed with, and that in the way that which we had uh, traditionally treated the commentary, 
uh, really elevated them to the same level uh, and that there was no basis, as he stated, for differentiating uh, between the rules and the commentaries. Uh, he also pointed out that in promulgating the rules relating to legal advertising, which was the subject of that case, uh, uh, or relations between the press and bar, the Law Society is performing a regulatory function on behalf of the legislature and government of Ontario within the uh, meaning of Section 32 of the Charter. Uh, the rules, of course, cover a wide uh, variety of activities of our, our profession. I don't think they're quite as restrictive as uh, John Evans would uh, have had us believe earlier this morning. I think, frankly, most of them are, are pretty basic common sense about how we conduct ourselves in, in uh, this profession. Uh, they deal with such obvious obligations uh, as integrity, competence, service to clients, confidentiality, and, and conflicts. They're not uh, comprehensive or exhaustive by any means. And in our daily practice, all of us uh, find, uh, confront problems that uh, require us to consider our ethical duties and they're often not uh, precisely dealt with there. In, in such situations, I would first encourage uh, members of the profession to, to consult fellow practitioners, to seek out uh, perhaps uh, more senior members of the bar and ask for advice uh, of those who've had experience perhaps in the kinds of uh, ethical dilemmas you face. Uh, if that is not felt to be appropriate or satisfactory to your particular needs, I then encourage you to contact the Law Society and ask uh, for advice. Uh, that happens, uh, I guess, even on a daily basis. And, and uh, the, the uh, staff of the Law Society, in the first instance, uh, uh, will probably be able to uh, address your concerns. Uh, in those cases where the concerns are a little more uh, unusual or unique, uh, then uh, it's quite common for the uh, staff of the Law Society to consult uh, with a bencher or a senior member of the bar who may specialize in the field in question. If the issue is of a broad and general uh, concern and, and perhaps of a novel concern, and with our changing uh, the nature in which we practice law with, uh, with mega firms, with specialization, with the technology, technological changes that are confronting us daily, uh, we are finding more and more cases such as that, then uh, uh, Stephen brings those matters to the Professional Conduct Committee. And that our committee uh, is, is, uh, is uh, charged with dealing with such inquiries and giving uh, opinions. Uh, those opinions will be shortly uh, brought together uh, in, in a volume of material, the opinions over the course of uh, the last number of years, both uh, by, by uh, staff and by the Professional Conduct Committee, and they're going to be made available to all of the profession. But those are, I think, in opening, uh, some of the means which you as individual members of the profession can uh, address the concerns you have of an ethical nature. Thank you. Well, this morning we're going to uh, really talk about two of the rules that Mark has outlined in general. And one rather overlaps to what was briefly touched on this morning, and that is that when it's appropriate and when it's your duty to report what you can see to be a breach of the rules by one of your fellow members of the bar, most times I guess would be one of your colleagues. Though I'm sure these rules are undoubtedly imprinted on your mind and need no repetition, it might be helpful. If Stephen Travis would just outline Rule 13 for you, then we can get into discussion of what it says. Thank you, Chief Justice. The, there is in Rule 13, which is entitled Responsibility of the Profession Generally, uh, two paragraphs that address the question of reporting the appearance of wrongdoing to the society. During the last two years, there has been greater concern in the profession than ever before about when is a lawyer under a duty to tell the Law Society about certain facts that have come to his or her attention. And this is a very, uh, a very troubling matter for many in the profession, more so now, I think, than ever before. And when they, they turn to Rule 13, they, they look at it 
and some are satisfied with what's there and others are not satisfied. Uh, they find that, the, that that paragraph does not give sufficient direction. Uh, for example, I'll just read from it in part. It said, it is therefore proper, unless it be privileged or otherwise unlawful, for a lawyer to report to the law society any instance involving a breach of these rules. Where, however, there is a reasonable likelihood that someone will suffer serious damage as a consequence of an apparent breach, for example, where a shortage of trust funds is involved, the lawyer has an obligation to report the matter unless it is privileged or otherwise unlawful to do so. Now, the Professional Conduct Committee has struck a subcommittee that has been working for a few months on trying to put together something that, make, that is more helpful to the practicing bar than this paragraph. Uh, historically, the way this paragraph has been, has been interpreted is uh, the sort of serious conduct we're talking about is really fiscal in nature. And there can be situations where there would be wrongdoing that would be other than fiscal, which, where clients would be harmed. So the subcommittee is going to bring forward a proposal, a proposed amendment, which proposed amendment will be published to the profession for, so that the members of the profession can express your views on that, on that reporting uh, requirement. I think it's important to bear in mind, of course, that many lawyers uh, are cons will go and consult another lawyer and reveal to that lawyer, to him or to her, that they have committed a, a breach of the Law Society Act or, or its regulations or one of the rules of professional conduct. The reason that lawyer has been consulted is because of he or she is there to render to that lawyer who has confessed to him or to her, uh, they're there to render legal advice. And of course, when someone confesses something like that to you, uh, you cannot, without the permission of your client, make revelation to the Law Society. Now, of course, the, 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 the advice most counsel will give, or almost all counsel will give, would be to make a report of that matter to the Society. But the client says, well, that's the last thing I want you to do. That lawyer, by virtue of that relationship, cannot report those facts to the Law Society. It would be highly improper for him or for her to do so. And one thing that is occurring now, uh, we are getting at the Society more inquiries by, on tele by telephone or in person or by letter saying, here are some fact situations, or a fact situation, should I report this matter? And we certainly welcome those, uh, and members of the profession should feel comfortable in, in, in making those inquiries. And we've given answers, and because we've got a slight bias, I must confess, we're in the regulatory business, we're hungry for information about our members, and in events that have occurred in the last two years, I think we're, we're encouraging more and more members uh, to, to tell us about, about matters. And uh, that's a trend that uh, I, I think just reflects the sort of modern realities. The, however, many persons still observe a practice, and I don't think there's anything wrong with it, personally speaking, of going and speaking to a senior member of the bar uh, to discuss a particular ethical dilemma and how that dilemma should be resolved, and particularly where there should be, a, if there should be a reporting to the law society. Perhaps this might give a second crawler there of the uh, of persuading the client to go to the law society, Sorry. and we can do this discussion. Quite often, a uh, lawyer will be consulted by a client, and the client will have invested funds with the, the lawyer, and the investment's gone sour, and the, all the client wants is to get the money back. And you can get into sort of dangerous terrain here because. No, we're just uh, telling the duty, though. What, what the rule says. Yes. <laughs> what you've, you've got to do is you've got to 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 persuade the client to make a report to the law society. If the client doesn't want to do that, the you've got to tell the client that he or she is going to be out of luck in coming to the law society's compensation fund, because they if they won't go that avenue and it comes to the attention of the compensation fund department of the society that they had been advised of this, uh, then they will be, they will kiss goodbye to their chances of recovery from our compensation fund. So I think that's, that's a reality. And of course, the, the lawyers will, are increasingly, I think, encouraging clients to make those sort of reports. However, of course, if the client says, no way are you going to tell the law society, uh, then, uh, then the, uh, the lawyer's hands are tied. Well, Bob Carter, this probably often comes up in a criminal law practice where a lawyer may come to you and say that he's defrauded a client. The client uh, is aware of it, is now pressing him for money. The client has his own lawyer. And the client, you speak to the client's lawyer. 
and the client says, um, Bob, I don't want to hurt this lawyer. I have to say the, the lawyer for the other client. I don't want to hurt the lawyer. I've got nothing against it. I just want my money back. Um, what is your position? Difficult. <laughs> First of all, the information that you get from your lawyer client is obviously privileged, and that can't go past you. The problem is that the lawyer for the victim client doesn't want the dishonest lawyer reported to the Law Society because he's going to be disbarred and will have no chance of repaying the money. Uh, so you've got to be very careful, as Stephen has said, to point out that accepting the money back in return for a promise not to go to the Law Society may well be a breach of the criminal code and if you're aiding or abetting in this breach of the criminal code, uh, you're guilty as well. So the, uh, the safe thing, of course, is to get everybody's consent to be able to go to the Law Society, report the matter, and have the matter determined in the proper way. As a practical matter, ultimately, the Law Society is going to find out about it. I don't know of any, there may be some, but I don't know of any case where a private arrangement has been entered into whereby the client has gotten <coughs> back his money and nobody has been the wiser. What usually happens is the dishonest lawyer steals the money from another client to repay the client who's complaining and via that route it gets to the law society and if this cozy arrangement that started in the first place uh, is then discovered, everybody's in trouble. So the best way, I think, obviously, is try and persuade everybody to openly bring the matter before the Law Society. Earl, do you have any trouble with this? Uh... I don't have any trouble with it. I think that's the, uh, that's the counsel of the prudent. The last thing a lawyer wants to do is get himself either before the Law Society or worse, the criminal courts. Uh, if I had a problem like that, I think I'd go see Bob Carter. <laughs> well, the difficulty, I suggest, is that nobody might say it, but it's implicit in discussions for settlement that you don't want a charge laid. And um, if that um, is a, an inference in the agreement, then it would clearly violate the criminal code, Bob, and everybody would be in trouble. That's right. Um, a lot of people would be residing up in Beaver Creek. <laughs> well, the, the rule speaks of... Um, uh, of two uh, matters. One, when it's appropriate to uh, advise the Law Society of a breach of the rules, and the other, when, it, when it's an obligation, which, which I think is limited rather to, uh, on surface, to where there's financial damage being done to the client. But nothing about the rules speaks of reporting it to the media. And, of course, we heard earlier discussions today of, of a practice which has developed of uh, reporting um, not merely the Law Society, which is the rule, but to the media. And the danger, I think, of that um, is that in that way, um, what the lawyer has done may not be turn out to be very serious or any real default at all, because if it's initially reported without for clear investigation, it may turn out to be an unfair allegation or one, a very minor one. Um, but there appears to be some feeling that um, it's either the most practical way of doing it or it should be done. Jim Callwood, what do you think of it if you were in the, a law firm and um, you were the person who suspected of doing something wrong and the firm goes beyond their duty to report the Law Society but goes public with it at the risk of the complete damage to your future's lawyer. Is that, is that appropriate to do? <laughs> For your partners it's, to do that to you? This is my ox that's being gored? Yeah. Um, well, I would, uh, I had utmost respect for the point of view put forward earlier by the earlier panel that it's the best route to go is, uh, is uh, open disclosure, uh, keeping in mind rules of libel and slander and uh, that the, uh, and the safest way to do uh, to do to handle a difficulty is to 
put all the cards on the table. And um, I, I, we are, there is some suggestion, I don't know any of the players in, in those two scenarios that were presented of the two law firms handling a difficulty differently. Um, I don't know any of the players, but there's some suggestion that someone in that uh, was, um, the law firm uh, went public far too quickly, maybe, there is a suggestion, maybe, maybe I misread this, and that someone uh, relatively innocent uh, is suffering or, and will suffer for a long time from that. Um, on balance of the rights of individuals and the, um, and the right of, um, to have uh, disclosure on balance, um, I think that a person, uh, that it's safer to say all of this is going on and to take what steps you can to say we don't know yet, we haven't, to make it clear that the investigation is continuing and that uh, as uh, there's no, uh, uh, there's no suggestion this person is a, is a monster. Um, the, we just are opening this investigation and um, proceeding. And um, better than having it leak out, which is what magnified, Lang Mishner comes up as a mythic person almost, he almost has a personality for me now. Um, and rather than have it leak out piece by piece by piece and make it seem like an enormous story, uh, to get, get it over and protect your person, especially if it's me, uh, as much as you can. Okay. Well, if I ask you this, though, going back to what, what right are you protecting? I'm assuming now that it's been reported the Law Society. I think what they were what, trying what is, to do is protect the reputation of the organization. All right, well, I'm worried about that, but what, at the expense of the lawyer who, who, who is going to be ruined for life, perhaps, even though it turns out to have been very minor. I'm just trying to find what the reason for it is. The, the, the public right to know is, is, is sometimes a, a bit of, of, of a slogan without always meaning. And, um, well, it really becomes the media's right to know, isn't it? The, in this case. The but if it's for the law society, I've got no strong view on it. If it's for mm -hmm. the law society, I'm trying to find out what interest is there. A self-interest firm to get this mm -hmm. off their back? Or is it... It's, uh, it's uh, cleaner than damage control and looks better. <laughs> um, and um, But certainly to, uh, to, to protect their person, uh, they should figure a way to do that in the, uh, initially as well. We should do this, we should tell the media what's going on, but let's protect our person. Mark Somerville, what do you say about this? Because it's a practice going on. And, um... Well, I think it comes back to the whole issue of self-government. Uh, if, if we have been, as we have been, uh, privileged to govern ourselves as a profession, we have to be uh, extremely uh, cautious and uh, careful in how we do that. And uh, I think we'll only continue to enjoy that privilege. Uh, if we, we go that extra mile, I think what's happening here is, is a, a realization of the uh, uh, that self-government itself is, is uh, frankly in jeopardy. Uh, I suppose it's always in jeopardy and therefore we want to be very careful that we as a profession ensure uh, the extremely high standards uh, and that we do that by encouraging our members to cooperate. Well I understand that but we're talking about whether you're doing that by, by reporting the Law Society or you're doing it by reporting it to the media in advance. At one time obviously if something's going on then the media will know. And I'm just wondering whether you think it's the an added duty beyond now the rules of, of your of conduct that firms follow the practice now. Has this become a new duty that the law society is going to look to? To report to the media? Re yes. Well, I, frankly, I see that's uh, as a separate issue entirely. Uh, uh, that is a, a public relations issue, more a, a political issue, a damage control issue. Uh, I don't think personally that the Law Society itself has an interest in how the firm uh, addresses the media, subject to the uh, rules that we've talked about earlier in dealing with the media. But I, I see the, those as two distinct issues. Earl, what do you say? Well, my experience is that in the light of the Lang Richner affair, firms report things to the Law Society in some, some considerable detail and at a fairly early stage that they never did before. But my experience also is that uh, for the most part, firms do not see any duty or any good reason to uh, involve the, the media in a situation like McCarthy Tetro with Cooper where there was clear criminality, maybe one thing, but uh, I think it is uh, 
preferable in most cases until you get to that point to uh, to keep it out of the media for the protection of of the firm as long as the law society is fully advised and uh, and it can be worked out. Many, uh, who, who certainly there's clear criminality, that's uh, there may, may be a different duty. But in many of these situations, there may be some breach of, of uh, ethical law society standards that don't amount to criminality. Could be very damaging to the firm. And I think the uh, the best kind of damage control is to uh, resolve it internally with the aid of the law society and stay away from the media. Bob Carter. Well, just one quick comment. It's my recollection that when the uh, second incident arose, both instant, both were reported in the newspaper <laughs> side by side. They had Cooper pleading guilty and going to jail, and the other side of the page had the story about the other law firm having a problem with their net member who was named, and it appeared as though he was going to go the same route as Cooper, and it was a terribly unfair impression that was left. But I suppose that that's the ethic of the media, not the problem that it, that it was reported. Well, I think there, in fairness, the, you recall, Bob, but at that convocation, we had just finished dealing with the Cooper matter yeah. when the press release came in from... Uh, uh, yeah. from Blake Castles. Uh, uh, the reality was it was literally within minutes uh, that they that we became aware of the of the second matter so the, the well, press became aware of the of the results in the Cooper case and of the report uh, in in the Donaldson case at the same instant basically. but it's a big newspaper they didn't have to be on the same page and appear in the public's mind to be related all right well now we're going to turn to another rule which I think is um, uh, very timely and that's a question of conflict of interest. Um, uh, there's been a, a new phenomena, certainly a very recent date uh, in this province, of major firms um, getting together under one banner, amalgamating firms. Also, firms in, with firms of, of affiliations in, uh, in the other provinces. And that has resulted not only in lawyers of two firms getting together, but some going to other firms as well and spreading out uh, their associations with many other firms. And we have other firms sort of splitting apart or disagreeing and going their own way and joining other firms as well. So there's a great deal of mobility in the practice of law in Ontario, more so than there was before. And the question hap is, what happens if, if for example, you leave one firm and take a file with you that you're working on and go another firm and find the other firm is the other side of the transaction. Um, what happens? Is, is there, do you have to get out? Both sides get out? Uh, where do you go? And that raises, I think, um, the important rule of conflict of interest, which is rule five. And like Stephen Travis, just to generally outline it briefly what the rule says, and then we can get into discussion of it, Stephen. Thank you, Chief Justice. The Rule 5 uh, deals with conflict of inter interest and impartiality. It's a rule that uh, lawyers turn to with increasing frequency. The uh, problems present themselves all the time in law firms, and most conflicts of interest are in themselves quite innocent. Uh, you, there is a, a view in a lot of quarters, for example, that uh, lawyers should adopt stricter firm policies. For example, in the present rule, if you can represent both the purchaser of a property and the seller of the property in the same transaction, of course, they have to understand that uh, no information be kept confidential so far as the other party is concerned, and they have to be made aware uh, that you may have to, at some stage of the transaction, withdraw. Now, what uh, the reason conflict of interest is increasing in interest is a re recent decision of the Supreme Court of Canada, the Martin and Gray case. And there were two judgments there, one of Sapinka uh, and one of Corey. And I'm not going to comment on this case because I'd be poaching on Earl Cherniak's uh, terrain because he's going to address some of the ramifications of this. He's also going to, uh, to talk about lawyers when commercial transactions 
the, the, like the phenomenon where someone you you incorporate a company and do the corporate work for this for the owners of the company and they bring another person on board as a co-owner and uh, that person doesn't get legal representation uh, you wind up representing them although you have never viewed that new owner as a client of yours and the next thing you know there's a breakup of the uh, company and uh, the majority owners are trying to suggest that you continue on in the case and you think there's nothing wrong with it in any event, uh, I'd like to turn this subject over to, to Earl because he's got uh, some... All right, you tell us about Martin and Gray and what happened. Just before I do that, I want to comment on something uh, you said. Chief Justice, uh, you called me a regular customer of the Court of Appeal. I never thought of myself quite in that way before, but it's an interesting concept. Uh, I'm just wondering <laughs> what I do, as I sometimes do when I consider the goods damaged and I want a refund. <laughs> And remember, the customer is always right. <laughs> <laughs> My father was in business for years, and he had a policy that the customer was satisfied of his money back. Do you think we could do that in the Court of Appeal? <laughs> Not in your case, Earl. <laughs> <laughs> Among the most pressing problems that uh, law firms, small and large, laterally mostly large, uh, face is this uh, question of conflict of interest when considering whether they can act on a matter usually uh, usually litigious and it, and the problem has been superimposed by uh, the mobility of uh, particularly junior associates uh, or even more senior and the uh, and and the issue of with the many mergers creating large and mega firms uh, in the province and indeed the uh, the country, and uh, what has, uh, over the years, particularly the last 15 years, been a great deal of jurisprudence on the issue uh, where, where for one reason or another, one side tries to disqualify the other side from acting. Of course, those are cases where there's already two firms acting. Many times these situations arise before the lawsuit starts at all. and. Uh, up until recently, and, and, and even since Martin and Gray, there was a considerable judicial uh, difference in, in, in the country. The English rule dealt with uh, the probability of mischief. Uh, the uh, applying party had to show that the potential conflict involved the probability of mischief. That rule didn't find favor in many cases in Ontario, which uh, applied a rule uh, that dealt more along the lines of the uh, appearance of impropriety. And uh, many lawyers were disqualified uh, where there was no proof of any real uh, problem, but uh, there was an, a, a potential appearance of impropriety. The Western cases went the other way and tended to follow the English rule. The American cases went farther, went even further than the than the uh, Ontario line of cases, and adopted a, a a position of an irrebuttable presumption that uh, when certainly when when uh, when a lawyer had some uh, uh, prior knowledge of the circumstances or the client, there was an irrebuttable presumption that that confidence was passed on to. Uh, the firm that he was with, if uh, or or the firm that he moved to. Uh, many of these issues were resolved, but I'm not at all sure. Finally, in the uh, case of Martin versus Gray, that was recently decided by the Supreme Court of Canada. The facts there are instructive. Dangerfield was a junior uh, uh, acting with uh, her senior um, in a hotly contested. Uh, Manitoba lawsuit. Ultimately, uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, learned many conferences in the course of so acting. Ultimately, Ms. Dangerfield moved to another law firm. Her principal got appointed to the bench, and uh, their client appointed uh, other counsel. The other side's counsel remained constant throughout, and that litigation, being hotly contested, continued uh, unabated. Ultimately, Dangerfield's law firm merged with the other side's law firm, and Dangerfield became a member of uh, that law firm. She swore, and everyone in her firm uh, conduct, uh, uh, dealing with the litigation swore that she had not discussed the litigation with those in her new firm 
that were and had been conducting the litigation and that she never would uh, and that whatever walls or cones of silence were needed would be and had been put up. On the application before the judge of the first instance, he refused to disqualify her firm. This litigation was going on for years. It would have been highly prejudicial uh, to, uh, to the client to have to uh, uh, instruct new counsel and uh, the judge of uh, uh, I'm sorry, the judge of first instance, I'm sorry, the judge of first instance disqualified the, the firm. The Manitoba Court of Appeal reversed that judgment and the matter came to the Supreme Court uh, of Canada. In the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, seven judges sat and they all came to the same conclusion. They all restored the uh, judgment of the uh, of the, the motions court judge, but they did so for quite different reasons. The majority judgment was, uh, was delivered by, by, Chief, by Mr. Justice Pusapenka, and uh, he spoke for all four judges, uh, and uh, he dealt with the competing values uh, that were present and that had to be uh, uh, addressed the integrity of the system, the right to counsel of one's choice, and the need for mobility in the, in the profession. He found, he did a complete review of the jurisprudence in the common law world, and he found that the United States position of the irrebuttable, the irrebuttable presumption uh, was simply too, too strong. And uh, he found that that presumption that there would be uh, communication could be rebutted by uh, clear and convincing evidence which uh, he did not find uh, to be present in the case because the simple statement by counsel that there would be no such a communication was not good enough and he left it in effect to the governing councils and the Canadian bar to come up with uh, schemes of, uh, of uh, ways to protect the confidence that might satisfy the uh, the, the bench. Uh, and uh, he dealt with the issue of the mega firm and he said in effect that the misuse of confidence by partners and associates could not be automatically imputed in the era of the mega firm, especially when firms had, uh, had offices in, uh, in uh, uh, multiple cities. Mr. Justice Corey spoke for the other three members of the bench, and as I say, he came to the same conclusion, but he stated the principle very much more strictly. To him, the public confidence in the judicial system was absolutely paramount. Justice had to be seen to be done, and he would not admit of any suspicion in the minds of the public that confidential information uh, might possibly be revealed. He said that uh, lawyers associate with, with each other uh, in the hallways and on the golf courses uh, uh, and in meetings in, in the like and the public would be uh, justifiably concerned that there could be an exchange of, uh, of conferences notwithstanding what, uh, what was said and he adopted or would adopt the principle of the irrebuttable presumption that when one lawyer uh, moves to another firm the confidences that she has will be shared no matter what uh, the affidavit evidence was. He thought that in the era of mega firms uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, they, they and their clients would have to bow to the overriding public inference. On the issue of Chinese walls, he referred, indeed, he actually referred to Genghis Khan breaching the original Chinese wall and so much for Chinese walls and, <coughs> and the cones of uh, Silence. What's really ominous about the judgment uh, on the facts on the facts through that case, certainly in Ontario, would have been pretty clear what would have happened uh, all the way through based on our jurisprudence here. What's ominous about the case is that it was a four to three decision, and Mr. Justice Corey explicitly left open the question of uh, what would happen when a lawyer uh, from one firm moved to another firm where that first lawyer had absolutely no contact whatever with the client or the matter in issue, but the firm 
indeed did. And of course, the danger would be that in casual conversations in the firm or at meetings or the like, some knowledge about the uh, about the uh, issue might have been uh, might have been passed, or there could be a a, a a suspicion that it could have been passed. So with a 4-3 decision by the court, with the two members of the court that made that decision uh, now retired from the court, one on each side of the issue, uh, seems to me that we don't fully know the, uh, the extent and the final fallout uh, of this issue in this country. Well, as I understand the present uh, position is in the majority judgment, it was quite clear in that case, obviously, that uh, uh, Ms. Dangerfield had taken an act apart uh, in preparing a case uh, and then goes to a firm which is on the opposite side, I think I would have very little difficulty in saying the firm's excluded. Uh, even though her, she swore an affidavit, she would not consult it. Also be contrary to her duty as a lawyer to, she'd be breaching her confidential information. And every other member of the firm, by the way, also swore the same, that it had never been discussed. Uh, the court said that that new firm couldn't act. And I think that's uh, axiomatic in a sense. The difference is, is can you ever rebut that presumption? And uh, as I read it, that it will be irrebuttable presumption now until the law society sort of gets, sets out sort of Chinese wall rules, whatever they may be. But June, as a member of the public, uh, what would you feel that say that I had acted as a junior consul in a case uh, for you, and for some reason you go to another consul and I then go to the other side, and I'm in the firm. I don't tell him anything about it. I promise, I swear I won't do it. W would you accept that? Or would you No, want I think the public perception of the Chinese wall is that it's uh, transparent. Um, uh, if I could comment on another aspect, though, of conflict of interest, which I saw more commonly when I was not, I didn't see these mega issues. I saw little ones where lawyers in, uh, in sole practice or, or in small communities were uh, uh, in a cozy relationship, in friendly, even uh, people who were friends with clients, thinking that it would be helpful to do this and this, and didn't see the trap, didn't see the conflicts of interest because it's all done so friendly, and I guess most of the time those things work. But when they don't, it's, uh, it's really um, a, a terrible disaster. And you think, how could the lawyer have been so stupid? So I think that, uh, that lawyers, in, out of goodwill, thinking they're saving people with fees, very often take on, get themselves into situations which, um, which are clearly seen as conflict of interest. If you hadn't been there when it happened, you would say, how could you have made that mistake? I think lawyers are not cautious enough of protecting themselves. Mark Severo, I'm not sure comment. Well, a little bit of background. First of all, may I tell you that the Law Society considered the issue of Chinese walls uh, prior to the Martin and Gray case and uh, rejected that concept in, in 1987, I believe, but we're going to have to revisit it. Uh, we have a subcommittee of our committee right now uh, looking into the consequences of uh, Martin and Gray, as, as was indeed invited uh, by by the majority decision in that case. It's interesting to note that the majority decision was written by Mr. Justice Sapinka, the minority decision, or the other decision, written by Mr. Justice Corey, both former benchers of the Law Society, so you can see the degree to which there's unanimity among the, among the benchers on these kinds of issues. Uh, the, uh, to me, I, I agree with Earl that there, the decisions are ominous. Uh, and there are huge problems created here that I think we've just uh, we just, uh, it's just the tip of the iceberg. I can't understand a distinction. If, if you assume that uh, Ms. Dangerfield, once she goes to her new firm, uh, uh, she is, is, there's an irrebuttable presumption that she shares that information. Well, that's only the minority view. Uh, uh, yes, yes, I, I agree. Uh, if, if there were that presumption there, though, uh, then surely there's the presumption that, uh, that uh, whether or not she was involved, with the case in the firm of, that she was formerly with, she would have the knowledge of, of all of her uh, partners in that firm. Let me just cast the problem a little wider from a practical point of view in this, in this day of mega firms. Uh, what if a, uh, a student uh, uh, with the Tory firm uh, joins, uh, is, is not hired back and is hired back by, uh, by Blake's or Oster's or McCarthy's? Uh, and that student has had some involvement or perhaps no involvement with the particular file. Does one uh, therefore assume that any ongoing litigation 
uh, uh, between those firms uh, can, has to cease. I mean, to state it is it almost seems to be an absurdity. Uh, in a smaller community, getting away from the litigation aspect, because there are serious consequences in the, in the corporate commercial field as well, uh, uh, secretaries and clerks uh, habitually go from one firm to another. And uh, as we all know, they're often more knowledgeable about the files than the lawyers. <laughs> and, and presumably carry with them that degree of information. Uh, I mean, if you, if you start following through the principle that, uh, that, that there is uh, presumed to be knowledge by everybody in the fir one firm of, of all of the cases. My closing comment is that it was interesting to read it in the decision, uh, I think it was Mr. Justice Pinkerl that referred to the concept of cone of silence. I hadn't heard that expression since the days of Max, uh, Maxwell Smart. Uh, when that cone of silence came down, we talked to Chief, that, that was another Chief, sir. <laughs> I'd just like to say two things. Uh, I was kind of surprised that uh, Mr. Justice Corey didn't also refer to David Copperfield's breach of the Chinese wall. I thought he might well have, and I probably should have at the outset declared my own conflict because this Ooh. case and the rules uh, surrounding it are one of my principal chief sources of business in this city, so uh, <laughs> I probably should have declared that. That's, that's why you'd favor an irrebuttable presumption. <laughs> Well, Bob Carter, this, this rises a somewhat different way in, in the criminal law courts, too. <clears throat> We've had cases where the courts have removed counsel, uh, the counsel of choice to accuse because of a conflict. So what's your experience with this? The courts have tended to, to uh, take it a little further, perhaps. Uh, the conflict that seems to arise more often now is where counsel for an accused has on a previous occasion acted for a witness for the Crown. In those circumstances now, most Crowns will take the view that because they acted for the witness on a previous occasion, they may have learned something uh, from that witness in confidence that they are now using against that wet witness to benefit the accused in the present case. And therefore, that shouldn't be done, and they move to have counsel uh, removed from the case. In a recent case, there were two counsel. One had acted for the witness on a previous occasion, and it was suggested that co-counsel cross-examined the witness so this problem wouldn't arise. The court held because the two lawyers shared office space that they probably would have talked about the information that the first lawyer received and therefore the second lawyer would be using that information and both were disqualified. Uh, I think it's, it's going too far. I think the fact that a lawyer was once counsel for a witness by itself should not create a sufficient conflict to make the lawyer uh, to get them off the case. I think there has to be more. There has to be, uh, it has to be appear that the lawyer is using some privileged information to the detriment of the witness. If that happens, the lawyer's gone. There's one other conflict I'd just like to talk about briefly. Multiple accused. You can act for more than one accused, obviously. Don't. <laughs> especially if it's husband and wife or two brothers. <laughs> Historically, brothers fall out, husband and wives fall out. If you act for both, one gets convicted and goes off to jail and the other doesn't, the one who's sitting in jail has nothing to do but think about how he got there and he's going to blame you for devoting your efforts to getting his co-accused acquitted and neglected his interests and that's why he wound up there and his wife, husband or brother didn't. So there is a conflict in that situation. Don't act for two. Well, one of the things I was worried about, Steve Travis, is as I read the rules that um, uh, I can act uh, for both parties in a transaction, say a commercial transaction, if I notify them that I'm acting for both sides and disclose that there be no confidential information from either side so that I have the full picture of both. And if they consent to me doing so, I can act. 
Now there's a falling out and litigation arises out of the transaction. As I read the rule, and you can help me, Mark, if I'm wrong, somehow I can act for one of the parties uh, if um, the other party doesn't oppose it. Isn't, is that the Chief Justice, I think if you're going to wind up uh, as a uh, witness. No, course. no, I'm acting counsel. I'm not a witness now. I'm, I'm, I've acted for two parties, and I've fully disclosed uh, that I act for both. They both, and they tell us, there's nothing confidential from either one of you. Everything's going to be disclosed. And they both sign the consent and write, and I do so. And that apparently is permissible under the rules, right? Now, now they're falling out, and one's going to sue the other over the transaction. Um, you suggest that I, I can't act for both uh, um, if there's litigation. It's probably the only way I could ever win a case, I act for both sides. <laughs> <clears throat> but um, as I read the rule, I could still somehow act um, for one of the parties. Is that my reading wrong? I'm just reading a rule here. If a conflict develops, I've just uh, mentioned which cannot be resolved, the lawyer cannot continue to act for both or all of them and may have to withdraw completely. Well, why wouldn't I have to withdraw completely? Well, it could be a situation where you might have to give testimony, but you may, your, your knowledge about the aborted transaction. No, I, I, my, my original gut reaction, I should, I should have withdraw completely and not have a right to carry on with either, for either side. Well, I think that's the most cautious and prudent thing to do in the circumstances. Uh, but you're right, you could continue to act, although I can imagine the circumstance that what will happen is that once the litigation is commenced, the uh, lawyer for the, the new lawyer who's come on the scene representing the other party will bring an application before the court at the first instance, I would have thought, to have me removed as counsel. No, but they, I think if the other side consents to it, I can carry on. That's the way your rule says, and I think. But in any event, it wouldn't happen very, very often, I wouldn't think. Earl, tell us a little more broadly about um, your concerns about conflict interest. Take, take these transactions, commercial transactions. Well, where people are coming in and everybody wants one lawyer to act for them. What are the pitfalls there? The kinds of things that happen uh, is uh, you get a situation where a firm has a long time commercial m a client for whom they act and for whose uh, business corporations they act. And uh, this client, for instance, wants to make a deal with uh, some impecunious fellow who's got great ideas and uh, no money. So uh, the first firm. Uh, uh, incorporates a company, draws up a shareholder agreement, draws up a couple contracts, and um, and gets paid. He may get paid by the corporation, may get paid by both of them, and things go along just swimmingly. And he continues to 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 do work. Eventually, the company gets very successful, and differences uh, arise, and a lawsuit develops between the longtime client. And uh, the impecunious, now more pecunious, uh, uh, other party. The uh, the lawyer may be surprised when he finds out that uh, it's suggested that he can't act for his client of many years in those situations because the other party takes objection to it. Uh, his client is furious, and his partners aren't too happy either. And uh, then he finds out when the lawsuit goes on and the new lawyers in the, uh, in the case uh, b take the position on, the, on behalf of his client uh, that the uh, agreements that he drew up uh, or the uh, way that he incorporated the company was defective in some way that affects the other fellow's rights the original law firm gets sued because the other fellow says, well, you were acting for me, weren't you? I mean, we didn't say anything, but I assumed you were acting for me. I didn't have a lawyer. You knew that. And the original client and the partners are still furious, even more furious, because they're sued. And those, th those kinds of situations occur on a regular basis because at the original uh, Original, uh, uh, when the original arrangements are made, nobody really thinks about it and things just go along because everybody is happy. The same types of thing occur when you've got an estate, uh, the lawyer acts as the trustee executor of the estate for the longtime client, and the estate for one reason or another wants to sell property 
to another major client of the firm. And the other major client of the firm may know something about that property that the people on the estate don't really know. And the transaction goes through, and uh, the estate said, if we had ever known the property was that valuable, we wouldn't have sold it in the first place. And everybody gets sued because the allegation is you failed to disclose what you knew from that other client that would have affected whether we would have sold and the price that we would have sold it for, and your duties were solicitor, trustee, executor, and the like. And those kinds of things happen in this province all the time. And the problem is they're not recognized, and they should be. Thank you. Well, now, uh, we were sort of stressing the, the problem from our point of view, from the lawyer's point of view. And we have uh, June Caldwell here, and I'd like her to say, take a few minutes as to how the public is looking at our profession, what complaints they have about our conduct, and what, what more do you think we could do to resolve those complaints? Yeah. Um, I can be quite concrete about this. Uh, <laughs> because Scott Kerr, who heads the Law Society's Complaints Department, does statistics, and everything's in the computer, so I can give you some, uh, some, some facts. And I want to say uh, that Scott Kerr is just uh, an excellent human being, and that he's uh, very unusual that I, fi I find. When something goes wrong, he, the first thing he says is not, I didn't do it, or, or even, it didn't happen, or it's another jurisdiction. The first thing he says is, let's see if we can fix it. That's very unusual. Um, the Law Society usually gets 4,000 complaints in a year, and this year is likely to get 5,000 if the projections are uh, correct based on the end of May. Um, the complaints are kind of market uh, governed. The, uh, there are fewer complaints in real estate transactions, but more in mortgage defalcations. Um, the complaints department uses 26 uh, categories. And the, the breakdown show that the most complaints come in real estate, nearly a third. Next is uh, civil litigation. And the one that you might expect, a matrimonial law family practice is third, not first. Um, estates and wills next. And the others less easy to, um, to categorize. The, as sitting as the complaints um, appeal commissioner, as I did for four years, um, these were complaints that were rejected by the Law Society's complaints department, and the complainant was allowed the, the was given the right to appeal to a complaints commissioner, who was always the lay bencher, with Mark Orkin as a as a legal advisor, and he wrote the handbook on on, uh, on rules of conduct. Um, we found, to our great dismay, that a number of the cases rejected by the complaints department were really violations of Rule 2 and the commentaries found therein, and something that in, the, in uh, British jurisdictions called shoddy practice, and that the Law Society had no vehicle to respond to a minor complaint, or even minor negligence for that matter, but a complaint of an irritating kind, uh, more, than, uh, more than something grand, like s stealing from the trust funds. Um, the, uh, delay, of course, a major one, as you might expect. Um, negligence next, but um, objections about the fees, which isn't in the Law Society's jurisdiction. I rather think it ought to be the people who regularly charge fees, which the which are taxed and and uh, discounted, the the bill discounted, are perhaps not um, upholding the finest traditions of the law. In the, certainly not in the eyes of the public. Um, conduct on becoming, failure to account, um, uh, the uh, undertakings not undertaken, uh, failure to communicate, a huge area. F um, the uh, abuse of process, misleading clients, and so on, and a whole other host of things that uh, are harder to, to, um, to define. But these minor complaints are 40% of all the complaints that come to the Law Society. So now we have a new way of dealing with these complaints, uh, as approved by um, uh, convocation this year, and then the implementation committee, which was chaired by Dennis O'Connor, 
uh, brought in implementation procedures, but some of them did not need to be uh, go through a changes in the Law Society Act in order to begin implementation. There, you will find if there is a minor complaint about you that you might get a telephone call from the Law Society instead of a letter saying, uh, what did you do and when you please explain yourself. The telephone resolution process has been going on for a couple of months now and uh, everyone is very excited by it. In other jurisdictions where they do have telephone resolution, they find that the lawyers tell the truth more often than they do when they write. I don't want to comment on this. Uh, this is straight up facts. Um, and that there are going to be other uh, warm, friendly procedures, not the hostile, aggressive approach, uh, I'm using very strong language here, which is perhaps more appropriate when there's been a serious uh, breach of, uh, of, uh, of rules of conduct uh, resulting in you know, large sums of money and so on. Perhaps that adversarial approach is the, is the proper one in that context. But when these are minor things of failing to satisfy a client in by not returning phone calls and not telling, not moving the case along in a, properly, um, it would seem that uh, just a let's fix this approach, which I'm happy to say uh, Scott Kerr f uh, fully endorses, is the one that's going to be used and you'll be seeing a lot more of it. And I think um, it's going to result in a public that'll be much happier uh, and feeling less as they do now that the Law Society is here to protect lawyers. And as I know the lawyers have a completely different perception of the complaints and discipline procedure. Um, so it, somehow we're going to find a middle ground here. And I'd like to say as well, and I'll conclude quickly, I'm taking time here, that, um, that my experience of sitting on discipline panels and that lay participation is now going to be obligatory on discipline panels, some of the new procedures that are coming along, and my participation in the complaints, resolu complaints appeal procedures has uh, uh, I have a new perspective on what what goes wrong. I think a lot of lawyers are taking on too much work and anxiety to to uh, um, get as much income and and a prominent place in the, in the importance of their in, in their profession. Um, they're taking some people are taking on too many files, at, with the result that um, no one except a maybe favored or hot client is. Um, gets well served and the clients notice this, they're very vulnerable. Uh, you're in a position of trust and uh, uh, not returning phone calls over a long period of time. You may feel that, that that can't be helped because you've got a sheaf like this every day, but the one client who is now phoning four or five times and has become so irritating you're determined never to return that call, uh, that's not really fair. The, uh, there's also inadequate housekeeping going on that people are just not, don't feel it's, especially in sole practice, don't feel it's important to do all of that stupid paperwork um, and, uh, and perhaps don't want to afford or cannot afford uh, to have adequate office help and I don't think that's a very good economy for you. And the other thing is to not recognize your own stress symptoms. The um, uh, professional standards now and, um, and the LINK program, the Law Society has got some very humane approaches now to lawyers who suddenly flip out either through um, grief. Uh, grief is not always the loss of uh, someone near you who dies. Grief is the loss of something important to you, a marriage, a place where you lived, a, a, a job. And people in grief do two things. One is that they don't do anything very well and the other is that they try to be terribly busy. And we have seen this latter more typical of lawyers, that a lawyer reacting to a very bad situation, uh, marital or whatever, uh, will start to work extra hard and take on a lot. And it ought to be a warning, of, that's a burnout warning. And, you, and lawyers are, seem not to be sensitive to their own, what's happening to their own feelings. And uh, the other is the uh, is uh, addictions of various kind, uh, drug and alcohol being the most obvious ones. But there's all kinds of other ways of being addicted, including to work, and that um, and that lawyers now have supportive, sympathetic help from the law society. I'm grateful to see it. It's one of the things that we look for when we have a lawyer before us in discipline, who suddenly is behaving very badly. We say, "What happened to you recently?" And the lawyer says, "My son was killed." Um, you know, simple as that. Uh, so are you, I think that um, there's, that under uh, the leadership of the 
previous treasurer and the present one, Jim Spence, and of excellent staff, Gavin McKenzie, we, we, as someone has already said, how lucky we are to have him, how lucky the Law Society is to have him. Um, in our profession, I once said. I <laughs> 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 uh, anyway that uh, that I think the the profession is going to um, feel very good about the law society in the next few years. Those those who have been disabused are going to be feeling a lot better. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. Well, I think our time is out and it's not gone by, and I, I want to thank my panel. Uh, I think it's a very singular trait of our profession that. Um, members of the profession make the time and make the effort to assist other members of the bar and also we're indicted, indebted to June Colwood. I think we can't forget that although lawyers are very individuals, are very individual and individuals, in the public view we're an anonymous group and therefore when one lawyer lets himself down, he really lets the side down himself. And that's why I think it's so important uh, for all of us to uh, adhere to the rules of professional conduct and to do as much as we can to see that our colleagues uh, do so as well. And um, as I said earlier, I'm very proud of the bar of this province. Um, I think we have a high standard of conduct here. I know it will continue to be so. And I want to thank you all for joining us this morning. And you're now ready for the next panel. Thank you.